Um, I have um, no financial or any disclosures. Um, thank you for the invitation to present on updates in infantorial posterior fossa penomoma in 2020. Um, I think that, you know, posterior fossa penomoma or penomomas in general in 2020 are still treated by primarily uh, maximal safe surgical resection and radiation. Although in the last five to 10 years, we've really learned about the molecular biology, um, a great deal about the molecular biology of these um, particular um, pediatric and adult, adult brain tumors. Um, I'll first start with discussing sort of the risk factors or prognostic factors um, with the penomoma. And I think that this is important because uh, the first point here is I think histological grade is really being controversial, inconsistent um, for risk stratifying a penomoma. Second to that, the role of chemotherapy has always been debate has been debated to a large deal. And even the recent COG ACNS 0831 trial that tested com the combination with radiation and chemotherapy didn't really give a clear signal as to the benefit of chemotherapy on top of radiation. So the number one um, or the most consistent um, prognostic factor that emerges from many of these multivariate analysis, now including molecular subtype, is level of resection. And now including molecular subtypes, we see that this is a significant in predictor of survival for these patients. And built into the molecular subtypes, I think are tied, tied to this are also age, gender, localization. But we also know that there are infrequent, but there are some genomic alterations that are associated with poor outcomes. Um, one of these is chromosome 1Q gain, and also P16 or CDKN2A, a tumor suppressor gene loss, which occurs in a small subset of these patients. So penomomas, um, they're divided into at least nine molecular subtypes, but the four main principal molecular subtypes, excluding the subapenomomas and mixopapillary penomomas, which generally but not always have, have more favorable prognosis, you see the first two, if you can see my mouse, supertentorial penomomas, about 70% are driven by a fusion between C11 orf95, chromosome 11 orf95, and ReLA. And another subset, and these are associated with a relatively poor clinical outcome, although um, the clinical or the, the clinical features for these are still being sorted out. And the other subtype driven by a variety of YAP1 fusions that are generally associated with more favorable clinical outcomes. In the case of posterior fossa penomomas, the majority are PFA penomomas, which occur in infants to young children. And kind of counterintuitively, these have very balanced genomes, as I'll describe later, and these have very poor survival and are most associated with um, metastatic disease. This as compared to PFB tumors, which occur in uh, younger or older children, about five and up all the way through adulthood. And these are characterized by high chromosomal instability and a favorable um, out outcome in terms of survival. Near, at five-year mark, nearly 90% of these patients will survive. So there's clear molecular and clinical distinctions between PFA and PFB. Now, I'm, I'm sure if you're all aware of the DNA methylation um, classification of brain tumors that has now been used to robustly stratify many different brain tumors and subtypes of those brain tumors. And this includes a penomoma, so shown here, PFA, there's some heterogeneity here, PFB versus relay tumors, and versus all other types of pediatric brain tumors. So what's, what's important to recognize here is that DNA methylation as an epigenetic mark can be used for robust classification of these tumors and you can also build this model so that you, if you had an unknown sample, you can use that data to predict um, what type of a penomoma or subtype of a penomoma that you may be working with. And this has been expanded more recently from efforts from um, both um, David Ellison and uh, Vijay Ramaswamy, in which they're trying to identify additional subtypes of these subgroups. So there's two major um, poster for posterior fossa penomoma subgroups, A and B, and these can be potentially broken down into further subtypes within these subgroups. Although some are, so this is shown here for PFA, expanding into at least two major groups and then PFB. Although these subtypes um, 
we're waiting further clinical validation or, or independent validation of many of these subtypes. So we're breaking a rarer tumor into additional rare subtypes with distinct clinical outcomes. And what I wanted to emphasize here is that it's DNA methylation classification that's being used as a tool for this stratification. And it's now being built, at least in medulloblastoma, into some of these clinical trials of this, as the primary tool for segregating these molecular subtypes in an objective manner. And when Michael and I were first um, characterizing the genomic landscape of infantentora posterior fossa penomoma, shown here on the left, um, as compared to an adult small cell lung cancer genome, you see there's many chromosomal rearrangements, many copy number alterations, there are many recurrent mutations. This is the kind of picture we saw for many posterior fossa infinite pen moments. It's almost like we sequenced normal genome here, but we knew from histology that these were actually um, pure, highly pure tumors. There's rare, or if, if any, no detectable recurrent fusions. Um, at this time, we didn't identify any recurrent mutations. Focal copy number alterations with rare. And the only thing that we observed was the infrequent chromosomal, chromosomal 1Q gain or infrequent CDKN 2A loss. So this suggested to us that potentially these tumors were driven less by genetic alterations and potentially more so by epigenetic or chromatin mediated alterations. This work was expanded um, by David Elson's group in which he sequenced about 250 posterior fossa penomomas. And here they identified rare and less than 10% of cases, mutations in a gene known as CXORF67, which has been now renamed as EZHIP. And they identified mutations in this gene, and they also found that this gene was highly expressed specifically in posterior fossa penomoma. But I wanted to mention that it's expressed in nearly all PFA penomomas, but mutated in less than 10%. So the majority of PFA penomomas have a lack of mutation or lack of potential driver um, that we know of. And what was interesting, what's interesting about this specific protein, CXORF67 or EZHIP, is that structurally it mimics the K27M mutation. So what was shown by Marcel Kuhl um, um, and others is that this mimics the actual mutation in terms of blocking an important complex or repressive chromatin complex that's important for silencing genes. So what you see similar to tumors with this K27M mutation is a loss of the repressive mark K27 trimethylation that's seen in these tumors with this mutation, but also in PFA penomoma. So this is a universal or characteristic feature of PFA penomomas and K27M driven gliomas. That is loss of this repressive K27 trimethylation mark. So this provided more evidence that although these tumors were relatively genomically quiet, they had very distinct tumor specific cancer epigenetic alterations. And we showed that these tumors have aberrant tumor methylomes, such as hypermethylation of CPG islands, loss of methylation at repeat elements. We wanted to ask what were the genes being activated by these loss of repressive marks. And we did profiling of K27 acetylation, a mark of active chromatin or actively transcribed genes. And we demonstrated that we could define the active regulatory programs in these tumors as compared to normal brain and as compared to other tissue types that were characterized by the roadmap epigenomics project. So these tumors have distinct both repressive and active epigenetic landscapes. And this is therapeutically relevant, I think, um, from our 2014 study in which we showed that PFA penomomas were sensitive to DNA methylation inhibitors. And some of this data was used by um, by Vijay Ram Swami in, in, in terms of leading a clinical trial to test um, DNA methylation inhibitors against PFA penomomas. And we've also been looking at exploring these active programs that I mentioned before in terms of identifying not mutation specific targets, but epigenetically defined targets that were potentially cellular dependencies in these PFA tumors that we could pair with specific drugs and test in preclinical models and also advance these in the future to clinical trials. And expanding this further, Michael Taylor has shown, has shown recently that 
these posterior fossa penomomas, I think we've been growing them all around. They prefer to grow in a hypoxic or low oxygen tension environment. And this feeds into many of the altered metabolic and epigenetic programs. Many of these enzymes um, that are important for depositing these methyl marks are highly sensitive to oxygen levels present within the tumor. So one of these, these specific epigenetic marks that's impacted that we were most interested in was K27 trimethylation. As I mentioned before, this relates to the K27 M mutant tumors that we see in um, DAPG and um, midline gliomas. PFA penomomas um, are highly sensitive to loss of some of these enzymes that deposit these methyl, methyl marks. And they're also sensitive to perturbations of the metabolites that are important for feeding substrates into the specific pathways. So this suggested that again, there may be epigenetic driven vulnerabilities in PFA penomomas and also metabolic vulnerabilities as well. So I think that I wanna just discuss some of the challenges, at least, at least I mean, in the field and in our lab um, for infant tutorial penomoma. So we think that EZHIP or CX467 is a potential driver. It's highly expressed in these tumors. We don't know what the role of this, these mutations are. Um, we haven't done the experiment where we've overexpressed this to see if it induces a tumor yet. So we think that it's a, it's a, it's a highly relevant candidate um, in this disease. In the case of tumors with chromosome one Q gain, these patients routinely fail therapy. So I think that's something in terms of clinical trial different that needs to be done for these patients. That these patients with this specific alteration are associated with um, frequently um, have um, metastatic dissemination. And combined with the genetic basis in terms of understanding how this is a driver, I think you have to consider what cells that this driver is being expressed in. And this is work um, from Michael Taylor's lab in which they've mapped the development to origins for some of these, these hindbrain tumors. And I think pairing these two together may lead to potential insights in terms of models for these, um, for PFA panomoma. So one of the challenges also is that there's been in this field, a limited availability of cellular models and patient derived xenograph models. The PDX models that we have that grow take months to grow, making it challenging to perform preclinical studies. Um, there's currently no genetic engineered models for posterior fossa penomoma yet. And I mentioned we're breaking down PFA and PFB. If we're going to break these down into additional subtypes, these have to be validated in additional clinical and additional perspective trial cohorts. But there's also future paradigms in terms of new technologies that we're using to model a penomoma. And I think this is particularly relevant in fusion-driven epenomoma. Um, we'll learn learning more about the heterogeneity in these tumors and the developmental origins. As I mentioned, primarily in this talk, epigenetic alterations or programs are defining how we diagnose, potentially prognose these patients, and are also leading to new insights for targets for therapy. And what I didn't I touch upon is there's potential for um, immunotherapy-based approaches, namely CAR T cells, for highly expressed antigen that we, antigens that we see on PFA and penomoma, such as HER2, and several others that we're working on in the lab. And finally, I think that as this is a rare tumor, and if we're gonna break it down into additional subtypes, and there's a lack of models for these tumors, I think it's gonna require large-scale international collaborative efforts, both in terms of characterization, model data sharing, and potentially even future clinical trials. And I think that's my last slide and happy to address any questions. I think I might be a little bit short, but um, hopefully we'll have a lot of room for discussion. That's all right, Dr. Mack, you covered it all. Um, do we, would we like to do questions now, uh, ISPN, or should we proceed with Dr. Jabato's talk and do questions at the end? Uh, it's supposed to be the questions after each uh, presentation. Yes, but I don't see any questions. Well, I, I, will I will ask a question. Does Can we say that 1Q gain confers radio resistant, radiation resistance, or do we know why those children are susceptible to recurrence? I mean, I think that in terms of those patients with 1Q gain, I'm not sure if we have the, the scientific data to show that um, the mechanism for why they're radio resistant, but I think that 
Um, these, these patients continue to relapse, they continue to come back. So I, it's not clear yet whether that's, that connection is, can be made. Am I allowed to comment as the moderator? Probably not, right? But that never stopped me in the past. Rick, can I make yeah. a suggestion? I think we've always all thought that 1Q gain was like something on top, you know, like cheese on the cheeseburger. Um, I'm not sure that the 1Q gain tumors aren't fundamentally different from the beginning from the tumors that don't have 1Q gain. So rather than 1Q being an add-on, I think they might actually be a separate group ab initio. But we don't, knew that, we don't know that and we don't really understand what's different. Would you agree with that, Steve? Yeah, I think, I think so. I mean, I think that these clinically they're fundamentally different, so. And, and, and biologically, we're seeing some, yep. some differences now, obviously, as you, as you know, at the single cell level.